name is Alec McMillan, and you're listening to University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. Hey, UC3P listeners. I'm Steve Crano, and in this episode of Chicago Land, we bring you an interview with Dr. William Towns. Dr. Towns is currently an adjunct lecturer in social impact at the Northwestern Kellogg School of Management and managing director of 4S Bay Partners, LLC. Dr. Towns has a long resume in social impact and community development across Chicago. This interview was recorded last summer at the Harris School of Public Policy, just as Dr. Towns was launching Benefit Chicago, an impact investing fund that leverages $100 million in assets to build wealth, create jobs, and enhance job readiness in the city. It was a pleasure to sit down and discuss impact investing and the needs of Chicago communities with Dr. Towns. Thanks so much for listening and hope you enjoy. We'd love to start with just having you introduce yourself to our listeners. Well, excellent. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. Uh, My name is William Towns. I'm the executive director at Benefit Chicago. Benefit Chicago is a social impact investment fund uh, here in the city, uh, and I'm glad to be here today. Excellent. We're very glad to have you. Can you talk a little bit about your background? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Those sorts of uh, personal tidbits. Yeah, so it's an interesting uh, case, and it's typical. I grew up on the far south side uh, here in Chicago in the uh, Beverly Morgan Park neighborhood. And then at the uh, uh, old age of seven, moved to Lakeview. And I think that move from the far south side to the north side really helped shape my desire to sort of understand how cities work. Um, Seeing uh, the conditions in one part of the city and how they differ uh, greatly in another, I think really pushed my curiosity to sort of understanding um, how how does this happen? Uh, Why are certain parts of our cities thriving in, in some cases and others not? And really, I think, helped shape sort of the path that I took uh, and the career choices I made. When do you remember becoming cognizant of those kind of divides between different parts of one city? Well, that was was immediate. And literally at at seven, the differences were so stark. You know, at that age, moving from, say, 115th Street to Wellington and Halstead, one, at that age, I thought maybe I wasn't still in Chicago. I mean, it felt that sort of dramatically different. Uh, remembering uh, it seemed to be sunnier, warmer, uh, people friendlier, uh, people out jogging and things like that. Probably exaggerated a little bit uh, just because of age, but that's how it felt at the time. You could see even uh, police officers, how people walked and conducted themselves were dramatically uh, different. And so at that age, it was something that I just started to take notice of. And it has sort of kept with me uh, all this time. How did you internalize that? disparity or the that difference in the neighborhood well what's what's interesting is i don't i don't think i saw it as disparity i just saw it as different right so i i didn't uh, at that time sort of understand the economic and, and social economic differences it just was one way seemed to be different than the other it was only later on after sort of really sort of understanding how income and taxes and those sorts of things affect how neighborhoods develop, amenities, those sorts of bonuses or disadvantages uh, from one place to the other. But really at that age of, of seven, it just seemed different. I didn't know why it was different or what caused the differences, but it just, it just seemed that there was a, a stark difference between the two communities. So I can see how that how you're starting to go down this path of your curiosity was piqued by trying to understand what makes cities tick and how neighborhoods develop. I'd like to talk about the work that you did prior to your current role at Benefit Chicago. Immediately before that role, you were an uh, assistant vice president here at the university. Is that correct? That's that's correct. And you were working on an initiative within the Office of Civic Engagement. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about that work. Yeah. So it was a phenomenal time uh, here at the university. I was, uh, again, assistant vice president in the Office of Civic Engagement leading uh, what they call the uh, Neighborhood Initiatives Team. So we were really charged with trying to figure out how we could leverage uh, the impact that a world-class research institution could have on a community, leveraging our research capacity, our purchasing power, our hiring abilities to really figure out how to best positively impact a community and help positive change that is mutually beneficial to all involved. And it uh, spawned a number of initiatives that are still current today, the U Chicago Local, the uh, Movies in the Midway, and, and just really sort of how we look at zoning and development, 
how we look at local hiring of uh, construction workers and those sorts of things. Uh, and so it was really a fascinating uh, and interesting time. That's not to say that these weren't without uh, conflicts and challenges. Whenever you're dealing with a large institution in a community that has seen a lack of investment or an underappreciation of the values that they have, uh, there's always tension. But what I found was that when you engage honestly, uh, when you're transparent with uh, your intentions, that the community members and partners understand they're not always looking for yes. They can accept a no if it's within reason and explained uh, in a certain way. And they look for partnering in how to sort of affect and impact the community that they love and live in. Uh, and so it was a, a phenomenal time here, still back on campus quite a bit, you know, working with the varying uh, schools uh, and, and really enjoyed my time here. So I just would like to pull a little bit on a thread that you uh, started to talk about. How did you engage with the communities around Hyde Park on behalf of the university, because you're you're playing an intermediary role kind of between this institution and these communities around it that have perhaps not always had the best relationships with this institution. Yeah. So I, I think one, I've had a simple approach, which is a three-step approach. One, I try to listen. Two, understand and ensure what I'm listening to is I repeat it back, make sure is this, this is, is the right interpretation of it. And then three, support. And you find there are ways uh, in which an institution or large institution, as my role uh, was here, that we can support the initiatives and work that the community is trying to do. We're not always at conflict. Conflict is what gets in the High Park Herald. Conflict is what uh, gets spread on social media. But there are plenty of opportunities that, again, within reason, using transparency, that we can talk about conflict and differences of opinion without damaging the relationship. Right. And so, you know, I really saw my role, I think, as, as you sort of eloquently indicated, as almost an intermediary that I'm trying to balance sort of the desires of my employer at the time, the university, with the desires of the community. And you often have to be a translator because they often don't speak the same languages. There is good intent and truth in people who are screaming at you or protesting for an issue. And so how do you sort of pull out the truth, kind of put the, the rhetoric and some of the other things on the side and say, yeah, they're, they're making a lot of points. They may not be all valid, but these three issues are. And then you go back in and, and talk with your partners internally at the university and say, hey, this is great. You are saying these, these four things. These two may or may not really be true or relevant uh, in this particular case. But in fact, we line up on these, these other two issues. And so on these issues, we need to sort of work together. On the other ones, we'll make our statements and say why we can't do something or, or, or what. But I, I find that in the end, both sides are approaching the same, trying to get to the same conclusion. But it's often that image, if you can imagine, there's a number on the floor. One person looks at it and sees it's a nine. The other person sees it's a six. It's only when we step back that we realize we're both looking at the same thing but from a different angle. And I think that's what often happens in our communities when you're so heated in, in the debate. Uh, and in many cases, from a community standpoint, rightfully so. To not say that the university hasn't made missteps in the past would be false. To say uh, community members in some cases may have been, uh, I won't call it ridiculous, but uh, uh, really over demanding in some cases would also be false. But within that, there are places where even in those situations where there can be agreement and people move forward and calmer voices need to prevail in those cases and then you can move forward. And so I, I really enjoyed it. Again, I still like coming back to campus. Uh, I still see neighbors and community members who I really had fond relationships with. Again, not that we all agreed on everything, but those relationships last longer, in my case, than the position I was in. Thank you. I really like the way you phrase that about the six and the nine and differing perspectives. So aside from your current work in impact investing and your prior role here at the university, you had some earlier experiences working for a um, large retirement community company and in real estate development as well. And I'd kind of like to hear about those early experiences, how they set you on your trajectory or allowed you to continue on your trajectory to your current work and um, what core skills or competencies you see from those earlier roles that you're deploying now in impact investing? Yeah, so I, I think what what's interesting is the work within, uh, and we're referring to Pathway Senior Living, 
uh, or Mercy Housing when I was doing those, is that we have, a, I have a fundamental belief that your zip code should not dictate your conditions and, and how you live, right? And in particular, in the case of senior housing, you have individuals who have contributed to their community, contributed to society for their entire life. And now in, in retirement age, they should be living the best possible life they can. And so what we try to do is to really provide a high level of housing, regardless of the income or the location where people live, that you shouldn't have to leave your neighborhood or, or leave the city to find high quality, uh, either senior independent living or assisted living. Uh, and so we worked really hard to uh, work with local community members, work with elected officials, state officials and those things. To, to piece together the capital necessary to construct a deal that was viable not only for the investors or the owners, but provided it at a way that uh, the local residents uh, could live and stay in. The way that sort of bridges, I think, in the impact investing is that, one, we have to sort of understand that the deal has to meet the business case, right, in, 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 in situations, that these aren't things that are uh, that don't work, that are poor investments, but you have to sort of make the business case. And the question in these situations is in a typical sort of real estate deal, you are, are looking at assessed values, you're looking at land purchases, and you're looking at sort of what the rents the, the project could sort of generate or the individual could pay. In many cases in the work that we were doing, the individual may not be fully paying the rent themselves. And so you have city subsidies, you have uh, HUD and other uh, sort of types of payments that sort of help get the payment to the level necessary to sustain uh, sort of the building. And so this is really, again, around one, relationships. How do we sort of talk with the communities? How do we sort of work with our elected officials and others to help construct a deal? Uh, we have to realize in some of these affordable cases, you're starting off on the premise that the deal doesn't work. That for some reason, the natural sort of markets uh, aren't functioning in a way that allow the transactions to, to, to work and, and to foot. And so you're already starting in a little bit of a deficit. And, and so it is these relationships and collaborations and things that sort of really work. I mean, we've had transactions where there might have been four or five, six partners in there, whether it's the state, the federal, other lending officers, partners, those sorts of things. And it took this sort of collective village really to come together, each one playing a specific role that allows uh, these transactions to really work. And it was, you know, again, work that I was very proud of. It's work, again, that's dealing with people. Uh, and so we have to sort of realize this isn't just a brick and mortar project, that they actually are working for people uh, and families in many cases. Uh, and, and you find, and particularly in senior housing, the stress that's on the children of the senior who they're trying to find a safe, viable place for them uh, is tremendous. Uh, it's not just the actual senior you're working with, but it's the family and others who are concerned about their loved ones. Uh, and being able to provide quality housing for them is something that's, uh, again, uh, incredible. And I was an honor to, to be able to do that. So I'd like to transition the conversation toward your current work um, with Benefit Chicago, similar to the introduction you gave to yourself. Can you give us a short introduction to Benefit Chicago? Yeah. So uh, again, Benefit Chicago is a social impact investment fund. It's a collaboration between the MacArthur Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, and Calvert Impact Capital. The goal of Benefit Chicago was to solve a problem that we see in many of our communities, that there are viable, uh, what we believe are viable businesses that exist in many of our communities, but for a number of reasons, can't get the capital they need to expand and grow their business whether that's hiring more employees, whether that's getting equipment, whether it's buying property to expand. There's a number of reasons, but they're sort of outside of the standard uh, sort of financial ecosystem or algorithms that approve uh, investments. And so we, we thought that part of the community's stagnation is this lack of capital inflows. And so if we could come up with a mechanism that would allow patient, flexible, risk-tolerant capital to flow into these businesses, that we could potentially see some uptick and improvements uh, in the things on the ground. The second thing that we also explored and looked at was this notion of individuals looking to have a closer tie to their investments, meaning that they were looking for not just a way to sort of donate money towards a cause, 
but wanted to be an active investor in these businesses. 